Hello, welcome to Murray's video channel. Uh, this is a special video, it's not about Murray, it's about a man we met years and years ago in, in Dublin called George Daniels. Georgie Daniels it has, it had a road show in the 40s, 50s and 60s. It was very popular, travelled all over Ireland, north and south and in uh, Glasgow and all over Scotland. Georgie Daniels is, is the uncle of Paul Daniels, the, the late magician, comedian. And when you hear, listen to George speak on this, and you'll think you're listening to Paul Daniels. Paul adopted his uncle George's patter to go on stage with him. George Daniels was instrumental, the Georgie Daniels Roadshow was instrumental in bringing forth people like Val Dunican, at the start with George Daniels, Hal Roach, the famous Irish comedian, he had his start with, and lots and lots of more people. There's very special friends of ours, George and Margot. Margot, his wife, was uh, the daughter of John James Duffy of Duffy's Circus. And so they're both show people, show people. And uh, they lived at number nine, Eglinton Avenue. And we would stay with them when we were ever in Belfast. And in this, in this video, you'll see, you'll see, the, and here, George sing, and then he gives the, the, the Georgie Daniels' story from start to almost to finish. Uh, what did you think, Mary? It was lovely. We yeah, had a great time with the, the families. Yeah. And uh, we're uh, in this one, you'll see a man come in, Frank Kavanagh. Uh, uh, he comes and talks to George. He didn't know we were filming, so he became part of the film, uh, which is on you. Anyway, uh, if you want to know more about Murray, www.murraymalone.com or email Murray. Uh, M Vickers, M V I C K E R S 44 at hotmail.co.uk. Now, subscribe, press the like button and subscribe, press the bell. Ding that bell, Mary. Thank you very much for more videos, more upcoming videos. You're going to really want to see these. Okay, say goodbye, yeah. Mary, to everybody. Goodbye, folks. Bye. The title. Yeah. Okay, well, you're on now, George. There's a little song I'm going to sing to you, a song I wrote myself some years ago. With a very nice title entitled, and Teddy Kids of the Wife, if the mattress gives way, dear, I'll see you in the spring. <laughs> I got married one morning, thought I was settled for life. I thought I'd got the sweetest little lady for a wife. She whispered that she loved me, said I'll be all of you soon. When we are together on our honeymoon. But I didn't get much for my money. I found she had done it upon me. When the guests had all flown, we were alone side <coughs> by side. We prepared for bed then. I nearly dropped dead when her teeth on her hair she placed on a chair side by side. Oh, I stood in blank amazement at her glass eye so small. She placed on the chair with her left leg and her right arm it hung on the wall. And I stood there broken hearted For me and half the wife had parted So I slept on the chair There was more of her there Side by side <laughs> 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 You're not going now, George. You've only switched the bloody tape on for you. Oh, oh my God. What's it? Oh, sorry, Frank. There you go. Right. You're a blue light stuff. Now, what's your last name, Frank? Is it Kavanagh, a Cavanagh, a Cavanagh? Cavanagh. 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 Oh, Cavanagh. Oh, Sit. Go and uh, pull the chair up now, Mary, will you? <coughs> Frank, do you know what I was thinking about this morning? That I get t if you could give me some way to get in touch with you, that I will come down from Belfast and see that man. I can get down for a four sixty pinch or stick it, you know? Right. And if he wants my way now when you have a brief bit of home. I'll give you my address. And I'll yeah. write to you. And so maybe you'd meet me in Dublin or you could write back and tell me, right, come say to date and I'll beat you. Right. Take yeah. me to him, yeah. get it done. And then I can go back down and say and go myself and collect them. I'd know where to go. I'll bring you over. You bring me over. I'll bring you over. 
This is great going to him. work on this, huh? Oh, <laughs> going to work on the neck. <laughs> Give me your address now before I go in. Oh, yeah. And after yeah, the dance, I'll contact you, you know. I'm not going to get it done that way. He's got me a set of tops made, you know. Ah, yeah. 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 we got a good dental mechanic. I've got yeah. a good yeah. burden for yeah. tops. Yeah. Yeah. Good man. I can never get a pair of suits for that. There's oh, four okay. pairs at home. And the price no, is right. Bloody good. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, okay, the bottom. Yes. You're all, oh, you've yes. got your own in the bathroom, yeah. Cheers, cheers. George, that was a great, that was a great number, that. Eh? If you had another beer, you could sing another you one could like have, that. Yeah, another good funny yeah. one before yeah, no, you go. I wrote that myself years and years ago. Yeah. I sang it these years every minute, I think. It's yeah. a terrible question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's only a one, that is a good one. Yeah. Now the way the wife has worried me, she nearly drove me mad. I said I'd leave the country and she said she'd be glad. So I asked them at the labour to send me overseas. They've given me the money. Soon in England I will be. And it's maybe someday I'll come back to Ireland. Twill be only when I hear she's passed away. For I can't forget the way she used to nag me. She had a mouth as big as Galway Bay. <laughs> in my dreams I see her once again in the boozer. When the barman says you're drunk, you'll have to go. When she was put outside, she didn't speak in Irish. It was a language that the barman didn't know. <laughs> On her back she had tattooed the map of Ireland. So when she takes a bath each Patrick's day, when she scrubs the sunlight soap <coughs> around by Clada, you could see the suds go down by <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Welcome to the party, Frank. Yes, I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh Chris, we'd have had the time later, we'd have had a party, had a couple of them, we'd have sang all night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be singing there with Bug Road now, we're going to finish on. I love those rubbish songs. Oh, no, you know, and you'll never hear them again. Hands to hold mm. someone you care for. I love Max those rubbish songs. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. We've seen them at Belfast, then. Did you see? Yeah. Mm. Now, George. You went to the early show, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, you come out at 20 yeah, past nine, yeah, you were and we were in the queue as he come mission. out, but I was looking for people that uh, I might know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Didn't see that. anybody, I don't know where George went. One number that stuck in my mind since then, I used to sing it as a boy, and I'd forgotten all about it. I sang it for them in there the other night, was that I thought he sang it very well, was that, uh, you sure it's true? Oh, yeah. When you say, I love you. It's a sin to tell a lie. You sang that thing again. Three years, mm. wasn't it? Three years. Yeah. But he has some pianist. Yeah. That makes the act, you know, not my gang or something. And he gave him full compliments on oh, the stage as well, didn't he? The greatest brother, yeah. pianist I ever. And he's dead on. Mm. So he knows exactly where Bagger stands. Yeah. Bagger can talk away. It's a very difficult thing to do. He can talk away without bothering about the pianist because as soon as he's a soldier, that plays the cards. Mm. Mm. He knows exactly. The key. You talk about harmony and working together. That's great, isn't it? You need that. You know. Your confidence is. It's very hard. I was like you the other night in the pub. You know, to stand up there and sing a song that you sang, Killarney, with no mm. no music. It's cold blooded. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing filling in the cracks. You know, you know the cracks mm. in between. Yeah. You have to get a breather. Well, there's nobody coming in with that in there. Yeah. You need that, you know. Audrey's a very good singer. You ever hear Audrey sing? She is, she is. Yeah. Is she? Mm. Mm. But there's nothing I like better, Frank. You've got to push her up, though. There's nothing yeah. I like better in this world. Did you get together with people who never sing song? I know, but I can't I love a sing song. Everybody sing. I love a sing song. I love a party in a house yeah. Yeah. where you can yeah. take your and time, have a huge race. That's right. And everybody's I would love it. I would love it. That's what we like. Yeah. It's the greatest thrill in the world to be able to sing song. It surely is. You can't beat it. You know, if you get people in good company, you can take a drink. It's better than one George Kelly anyway. One time, time yeah. he used to do all, all that. Mm. Uh, he used really? to go around from house to house. Yeah, that's right. Did you use that? Yeah. Have a game of cards and the, and the sing song. Years ago, years ago in Donegal when I was a kid, yeah. the only, we, we had no, the old man was signing pictures on, of course, but we had no relation, radio, no, nothing. But the thing then was somebody was going to America or somebody coming home. That's right. Yeah. Up to the farmhouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were fiddling hard mm -hmm. going many a time, mm -hmm. many a night. I could have gone as a kid. Enough. Mary, when I was a kid in Donegal after my mother died knocking around with the pictures of my father, I used to stay with all these women, you know. Mm -hmm. We had no caravans and I used to go to the first house to see. Hey, Mrs. You put me up for the weekend. <laughs> I had that many mothers. Yeah. No one would have taken me to America. I could have yeah. gone to America a million times as a kid. No kidding. I could have been nursed every night now. Fourteen people who went out. They were all immigrating then. Mm -hmm. I know I've never seen the boat going away at that fire. They used to sit in my village and he's shown. I watched the American boat out there. They all get sick and go back to them and they all get known as immigrating. In those days, you know. Sure. sure. Oh, oh no, that's British where the... And Donegal as well. That's what's in the corner around Priestley today. Yeah. yeah. 
That was a great song, Brady Gallagher. I sang that, Uncle Teacher. I sang that in Chrysler. I, I worked Chrysler several times. Yeah. Well, I'm quite sure I sang that song before Brady, because I'm an older man than her. Mm. She yeah. sang that song after me. I was singing that song when I was about 20, and I was Brady Gallagher, that young woman with me. Mm. She sang that after me. I was quite a young fellow. Mm. I got that so song. A lot of those know. songs have been revived. Really, oh, yeah. An old man in Donegal gave oh, me that song. Last five years. No, I, I learned that of an old man in Donegal, Christian. I never knew it was printed. I don't think it was ever printed until Brady Gallagher sang it. And Brady made a bit of her name, but yeah. she sang it. Yeah. But I was singing it way, way back with Harry Lynch. Mm -hmm. She's long since Harry Lynch had that bit of You don't. Well, I was singing Christian then. Yeah. Harry Lynch, I was about 16 or 17. Then. And those songs should even be revived again mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Sure, look at them. I'll talk a bit about it. I'll go with You can never cure it. I, I, at my time, went to London one time and I was singing all Percy Prince's songs. I loved it. Yeah. Come back, Paddy, you know. Mountains of the Morn. Yeah. All those ones that he had. Stone outside Dan Murphy's door and all that. That's yes, it. And the one track. Another one these times. Uh, 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 Paddy's uh, All Other Bridges. Yeah, that that's one. it. No, no, that was a I was I was making a great success when I was a kid, but as I say, I was only as good as the town I was in that night, because there was no television or radio. No. But I went they to made London. Their own entertainment. I got an offer one time to go to London just... as a singer, and I went to the Can Metropolitan Edge Road. And I, I, did, I was booked at, in Wyndham Theatre on the Sunday for an Irish concert. Mm -hmm. I went into an Irish concert in Wyndham Theatre. It was the first time I ever did the West End the last time. And it was for, for, for free, you know. For Nancy. Yeah, for Chris Hewitt of the Rescue. And I met a fellow young fellow in the dressing room. Who was as nervous as a kitten? And she is, who was a bad little daughter? I didn't know then, nobody knew them then. Mm. And he was singing, I thought you were a hell of a nice wise boy. Why don't you sing the Patsy? Why don't you sing the Percy Brent songs? Mm. So I'd be singing them as a, you know, a lot, a lot of old people say, Jesus, look at the success he made. Oh, yeah. He met me in the restaurant with well, that, but George only view, I never sang them. And he paid him sing them mm. at a bloody charity concert. <laughs> he so got it, and I didn't. Audrey's <laughs> sister. It was the right song. way to get it. He was younger than me. I was too old, you see. Mr. McGuire. Get up and down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr. McGuire sat down. Yeah. Good number, that. Yeah. Good number. Yeah. I like that one. Mm -hmm. I love your company, but I don't have to go there. Okay, George. I'll be saying I'm scared for that. Will you do that for me? I will. I'll do that for you. Oh, lovely. Certainly. Lovely. Thanks very much, George. Mary, thank you for your... I'll tell oh, Margaret for thank you for your hospitality. Indeed. Yeah. Lovely. 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 Charming company. Yeah. Lovely wife. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Oh, this one. That's good. No better couple has. <laughs> oh. Thank you, George. Fade, fade you. to black. Okay. It was okay. here, George. It was your luck. Good trusty business. Mm. Not money. No. Well, you were telling us about your uh, your mother being buried in Ballyshannon. Yeah. Right. What year would that be, George? Do you know? Only about 1924, I think. Mm. 24. I took my father, and he died in, uh, on the road. And you, was your father always in, in show business? And his grand, I'm five fifth generation in Ireland. Yeah. yeah. And Margaret's five generations too, of show business. Yeah. Mm. And what was her name before she got married? She was uh, uh, the McLean, Duffy. Oh, my mother Duffy. was one of the Duffy Circus. Margaret was McLean, mm. Scottish people, Scottish show people. Her father was a champion Scottish dancer, and he joined Duffy Circus. So as a dancer. So both of you come from showbread families. Very, from very long big, back. very, very big showbread family. As far as Ireland's concerned, Aye. you know. Yeah. And then Margot was a touch of the Scottish side now, you know. Aye. And my father, my mother was a, uh, her father was a German. She was Scotch and they had a, a musical act. They did a circus act with music, you know. And she played the trombone. And my father, they were Sylvanis, trick cyclists. Uh, circus, purely circus. Yeah. At the very beginning it was circus. And they worked in England. And then they came to Ireland. How my father came to Ireland, they came over here to join old Jimmy Lloyd's circus. Yeah. Which I have a book at home about. And uh, Jimmy Lloyd's son, his only boy, one morning they were travelling into Longford. Dad used to tell me this story, and I never believed that. I also thought it was a guy, can I read it in the book? Well, he gave me the book and I read the life mm -hmm. of Jimmy Lloyd. And they were travelling into Longford, and the uncle was sitting on a on the pole truck, horses, you know, and Dad was sitting beside him as a kid, and they were shooting pros, and the uncle shot himself and died on the side of the road, and they buried him in Edgerton. Oh, it was all in the book. Oh. Dad used to tell me about that. Well, now, my, uh, was Jimmy Lloyd Circus, my mother, and her father, bottled up for a minute, we've got gas. And her relations. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you don't know if now. No. And we're doing a bit of filming, you see.
we'll have to come back again. Oh. Mr. Daniels has uh, got the floor just at the moment. <laughs> He's got the spotlight. The one yeah. and only. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll see you in the hall later on. Yeah. What time is your Malta coming back? Oh, any time. Whenever the bus was uh, buses, oh. which could be early afternoon. Okay, okay. I'll Just see you later. Just taking some what time? Um, my mother at that time, Brenda, she was quite young, you know, 16 or 15 or something. And she played trombone, and my father was a trick cyclist. He was surrounded himself, his brother, and his father and mother. Silvani, I think was the name, but uh, when he met her and Jimmy Lodge, they got married on our circus that year. It was the first time they ever met. They got married at the end of the season, and they left the two. My mother left her troop, and Dad left it, and they started on their own bit of a show in Ireland. Yeah. They started off with slides. As my mother used to sing to slides. I can remember doing that. He used to show the illustrated slides. Yeah, like the Magic Lantern. And the one song my mother, uh, stuck in my mind all my life. And the only thing, I can only remember one song she used to sing. In that cottage by the sea, she was happy as could be. Like a bird, her heart was ever light and free. But the sun don't shine so bright, because she's all alone tonight in the cottage where he left her by the sea. Aww. That was one of her numbers, and Daddy used to show the slides, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. And then they started sending the silent pictures. Yes. And then they had six of a family, and she died and after six. She died at 30. Now she ain't one of them. What is Pretty looking woman, too. Very good looking, up. lovely photos of her. Blonde, too, you know, beautiful looking. She died in her 30, and then he broke his bloody heart, and he never bothered others at all. He, 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 so, you know, the kids drifted away from him, you know. Oh, dear, dear. So that was it. So how long did he live? Dad lived until he was, he lived a good age, lived until he was 76 or something. What is it? And he died up at Castle Bar. He left oh, me. Oh, Castle he, Bar, me, oh, yeah. He died outside Castle Bar. <coughs> and he, he was with me for years, and he decided he'd leave me, and he joined this other show, and he went with them, and he got ill up there, and he died there. So I went all the way up from Wexford. I was in Wexford, and I went all the way up from Wexford, and I took his body all the way to buried him with my mother. Oh, did you? Oh, Bobby isn't Shannon. that good? I buried him there, yeah. So have you have you any brothers? Yeah, one brother died last year, apparently. Oh, really? I have another brother in uh, the... Did he? Was he in the business? He was, was, sure. He was the Reardons. You know, the, the Reardons. Yeah. He was in that, obviously, ever since he started. He's bits and pieces, you know, but he, yeah. he got his check every month from him. Yeah. And he was an equity. He used to do a lot of uh, film work, you know. Mm. His wife was showing me some film, some photos of me when I was Sean Connery and all that. Oh, he's quite a good actor, but it yeah. could be, he was a good character man because he always wore a beard, you know, and he was always in a pub drinking a pint, like, yeah. or uh -huh. playing the postman. Or, oh, you know, yeah. all them bits and pieces. Oh, I bet we'd seen him in the rear. Oh, yeah, you'd often seen him in the rear. He's often mm. seen him in. And he was in that other thing there, I've seen it last year, the, the, pink, the pink taxi or something. Oh, yeah. Remember that thing? The, the purple taxi, was it? He was in a purple yeah. taxi. With Fred Astaire? Yeah, he was in that. He was sick yeah. with Fred Astaire in the pub, actually, in the film, you know. Mm. And then he did The Quiet Man, you know. Did you say? He did. Who was he in The Quiet Man? He was one of the... One of the crowd in the bar oh, or something. Yeah. So he used to get a lot of bits and pieces parts, yeah, you know, with the one line. 1952, you know. The Quiet Man. Yeah, I did, I did The Terrible Beauty with Robert Mitchell. Yeah. And, and Harris, Richard Harris. I've never seen that yeah, one. The Terrible Beauty. It was never any good. I went to America. It was an American production. Yeah. But I had a quite a good part in that. Mm. Mm. I knew Mitchum quite well then. Yeah. <laughs> He's made a mess of his life for drinking, hasn't he? Oh, terrible. Mm. He was at a dead. Well, he's an old I seen man now. Oh, he's an old man. It was, it was mm. an awful game for drinking, wasn't it? Mm. Right, he more special. You don't know, remember though, Scotland was the worst part. I learned to drink quite well. I didn't drink before I went to Scotland, but... I had a funny experience over a show in Scotland. I, I, I was playing in Bray in the tent, you know. I was up the road here. I was doing the summer season there. And I had quite a good show. It was doing very terribly well. People loved it because I was doing all these Irish melodramas. I used to write them all myself, you know. Yeah. Mother McCree, and Tears of an Old Irish Mother, you know. And those yeah. titles. Titles I used to give them. Noreen Bond and all this yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. And I used to sing a lot of Irish songs in the plays myself. I used to write them musically so that you could put in oh, a good Irish number yes. in each play, like... Mm -hmm. Just an old Irish lady and mother, you know, that type of numbers. Mm -hmm. And God, I used to do very well with it, you know. You I'd say I was born 20 years too soon. But anyway, I had just shown Brian two men came in, and a lady one night, and spoke to me. I said, could we see you over in the hotel after the show? I said, certainly, so we'd like to buy you a drink. You were Scotch. So I went over, and thank God, didn't they own a, hotel, they owned a theater in, in, in Greenock? Two brothers, Woolies, George and David, and they had a, the Empire Theater in Greenock in Scotland. Yeah. And the woman that was with him had troops marching. <coughs> so they said to me, would you like to take that show to Scotland? You know, complete now as it is. So I've never been out of Ireland. I've toured all the villages of Ireland. Well, they said, we'll book you for two weeks into Greenock when you finish here. 
and we'll help you with your expenses to fetch the company over and we'll see how it goes and if it goes well you never know what might happen. Mm -hmm. yes, we were delighted we all packed up and away to Scotland first time out props up on the back the whole last. We got into Greenock and the theatre this time wasn't village. doing terribly well. Uh, no, in Glasgow. Near Glasgow. Oh, yeah. Greenock and Greenock. Yeah. So we opened up anyway the first night he put plenty of paper in. Sure, Greenock was Ireland. They were full of it. Especially me with a green suit and a green hat and singing Mother McCree and all. Jeez, a pal of my cradle days, I couldn't go wrong. Couldn't go wrong. Packed the match. So you used to do Pal of my cradle days as a number then? I did as a number, yeah. I did as a play. Yeah. yeah. Used to call it Pal of my cradle days, number right. and all, yeah. a whole lot in it, you know. Yeah. Going to the workhouse and taking her out of the workhouse. No kidding. When I took her out of the workhouse, I used to come back from America, my brother was stealing the money, you know, not giving it to her. And I used to come back and take her out of the workhouse and buy her the armchair and put her in the armchair and back in her old home again. I put her in there, you know, back in your old home. And I said, Pal of my cradle days. We used to finish the song, it's mm. again. And the business was so great and great. We stayed apart and they packed them, packed them, packed them. They extended the visit and it did 10 weeks. 10 weeks? 10 weeks. Every agent in Scotland came and booked me. I left Greenock, I did Paisley, I went up as far as. Uh, Gaiety and Air, Edinburgh the Palladium. Yeah. I came back down and finished for six weeks in the Metropolitan in Glasgow in Stockwell Street. Big yeah. time, big stuff. Big finish, like, Big yeah. finish. Yeah. A big, 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 big finish. We're at the fruit. Yeah. And he built us all over the greatest Irish show, The Gossings from Glockamara. Mm -hmm. We called it. <coughs> That's the title I gave it, The Gossings from Glockamara. <coughs> and they built the bloody show all over the place. Great. And then I changed the name, but I changed the name to Springs of Shillelagh for some reason. And I went back again the following winter to do the same trick again. I went back the following winter to do the same thing again, and then I went back after that. You had three runs. I had three runs out of a crowd, three big, big runs out of Scotland. And I, I, I'll tell you now, Scotland was so big for me, and I'll say I'm the only performer that ever did a thing in Scotland. This, I wouldn't tell you a lie about this, God forgive me, no total enemy light, but I was the first man ever to sing the Wild Colonial Boy in Scotland. Mm -hmm. You see, and they went so mad about it. And I got it from a, a, in Bray from a, a New York policeman who came over here <coughs> and he used to sing it and he gave it to me and I went to Scotland singing the Wild Colonial Boy and I was singing it in the Metropolitan in Glasgow and there was bus loads outside no I am not joking there were six buses outside from Greenock that all came into the show that night and we, they played the Queen or the King in those days the King was alive then they played the King <coughs> on her as soon as the King was played that's it finished no more yeah. any theatre in Scotland or England yeah. The six buses wouldn't leave out there till I come out again and sang the Welsh Colonial Boy. And after the King, the manager had to come around and said, you better go out and sing it, George. And I went out on the stage when the King and sang the Welsh Colonial and then they got the buses and went back to do it. I have a paper cut sitting home. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. And have you none of that in tape? Hmm? None of that in tape? Oh, tape. Well, there was right no tapes then. There was no even, I never, do you know that I, I, I never even recorded in those days, I never recorded as a number, you know, oh, because there's no gramophone records. Isn't it? You were actually only as good as the town you were in that night. Yeah, yeah. You know, no hope of them here, you. You get on that tonight and it's all over the, you know, you're starting. You're nationwide, isn't it? You see, you're nationwide. And I was young enough and had the personality yeah. then to do it. Like you said, 20 years just too late there, John. 20 years too soon. Yeah, oh, too soon, rather, yeah. It was this thing, the magic box that made them off. Yeah. Well, Dirty Good wouldn't have got nowhere away from the magic box. No, so no one would have got anywhere. Well, I used to hear Val Dunican for years. He used to oh, be on I a thing called... Uh, uh, Seen around six, right. and it was it was on it was on the radio, yeah, and it was on. I'll show you a photo. It was on from uh, half five till half six. I'll show you a photo one time when I was playing that Metropolitan in Glasgow, and I booked a, I booked four fellas called the Four Ramblers. What do you want? You know, the campers. Yeah. And I paid them a hundred and hundred and twenty-five pounds a week for the four of them, and they were paying the agent ten percent. God, and Val Dugan was the corner man with the guitar. I had the phone at home. That's it. And he was the guitar man of the Four Ramblers. He and they did four weeks for me in the Metropole. At £125 a week for the four of them. Mm -hmm. Two shows a night. And he was only a kid and quite a young boy. Mm -hmm. But then he was in Bray along with me out here too. He was in the band out here. You had him at your show in Bray? He used to come over to the show. He was yeah. playing with the dance band out there, playing the, the, the string bass in those days. And then there was a fellow called Bolton. And uh, when I first went to Bray, he was running the period was down the front. Yeah. So the band was singing with him. Mm -hmm. Down the front. But I never heard Val Donegan for. Well, he came out of Waterford along with Hal Roach. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, this is what did it for the man. Mm -hmm. No matter who you go, go back to Ruth Barsight or anything. Max Bygraves, yeah. Well, Bygraves was always a music hall performer, I think, you know. 
Uh, more, you can see it when he works on the stage, you know. Yeah, can't you? He's yeah we, we've all saw him there at Belfast. He, 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 he looked like he was, uh, he, he like he was a thirty-year-old. Enjoying every moment. Oh. Yeah. I wonder how when old he was. He was. Yeah, he was yeah, enjoying, enjoying every minute of his work. I thought he was yeah. a brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought he was a brilliant. How old was he then? Oh, I see now he's well into his fifties, nearly sixty. That man. He's a grown-up, aren't he? Because. In the distance, mm. further away, he looks very young. Mm. But when he came right close to us, oh, naturally, you know, all the makeup and that. Terrific performance. But all these other fellows, Bruce Forsyth, and a lot of Des O'Connor. I hated Des O'Connor once, you know. But when I was over in, in doing the music halls over there in those days, they were really starting, you know. Nobody ever knew nothing about it. Mm. It was the jobs they got. To, and I said these quiz shows did a lot of it, you know. They got onto a chat show. Yeah, like Bob Monkhouse could sing about that. Yeah, sing of it. Yeah. Sing of it Especially know, if there was a bit quick fire in the responses. This is, this like, is where, yeah. this is where they got the money. Mm -hmm. And this is where they got the big name. She, yeah. Murray was unheard of in Scotland. I mean, he was just an ordinary bloody performer in Scotland when I was there. Until he hit that. Now he's known internationally. Mm -hmm. you know, in Scotland, when I was touring Scotland, Nobody the band, you know, he, I had the to tour with him, and his wife travelled with me. Maybe she played the accordion. Mm -hmm. But then there was other very good performers in Scotland that I worked with, a variety of artists, who never got the break. So around about 1940, you jumped from, what did you have? You, you got your first tent in 1940, did you? I had a before that. Mog and I started off our life when we first got married. I was in variety, she was in circus. Yeah. But she knew a bit about the fairground more than I did. I knew yeah. nothing about fairground. And when we got married, <coughs> we took a job at Dick Williams Fairground. Mm -hmm. And I loved it and I learned all about it. I learned all about Dodgy and I was mad about driving big lorries and the great and we had a lovely time with we a nice caravan there and we worked with them for about four years. And I learned a good bit about pump there. I learned all about the Dodge and Track and in the back of my mind all the time, I'm gonna have my own, yeah, naturally you know. Mm. Mark with the same we'll save a bit we we'll, you know. So I met a fellow called Maloney then one time after I left Dick Williams and he gave me a partnership with him. He had a tent, he had slot machines, he had a, a, a pongo. I was working the bungalow with the darts then, you know, to make it legal. And Mark was doing the shooter. And we went out together, him and his wife, four of us, with the tent. He owned the tent now. Mm -hmm. But we worked a partnership all around Dublin here, Mother Hayden and the whole mm -hmm. And we made a good bit of money. And he was a very decent fellow. He gave me, me 50, 50 cuts. I went into Dublin and I bought a heap of bloody slots. I bought a pongo, I bought a shooting gallery, I bought a lot of gear. I spent all my money on it. You see, and I said to Mark, what we'll do, we'll start into the halls this winter. We'll work the halls. You could do it in those days. Mm -hmm. with the one pair, you know, and I knew all the fellows in the halls all yeah. around beneath. And I said, We'll get a good living, we'll save enough money to buy ourselves a bit of a track for the summer, or maybe a set of chairs. And that's us away, I'll get a lorry, you know. God, I put out in the book these bloody halls. And we had to, we were in digs then, at least up, and this fellow came into, he was a travelling drama and variety show, a fellow called O'Keefe. Mm -hmm. And he says, George, he knew me, he says, George, he says, come here, he says, will you do something? I said, what's wrong? He says, you have every bloody hall booked around here. He says, and they won't give me, a, I'm with a company of four people, five people and the wife themselves, doing drama and variety. We can't get a date. He says, when are you going to start? I said, I couldn't start any time. But he says, would you come along with me for four or five weeks and we'll work the drama and variety and you give me the halls and we'll work the drama and variety. And then he says, we'll separate and you could start your abuse and I'll be on my feet again. Oh, should I help anybody, surely? So I went with them the first time we opened it was Selbridge out here. Here's the second thing was back to the road. I said, well, we did a Boston Selbridge. Jeez, we divided more money. I've never seen as much money in my life at that time. We went to Nottingham Cock, the same thing, packed. We went to Maloose, packed. And this one I lost a head. He started drinking. Oh. And he came into the dressing room one night and he was going to beat up the four pros he had. He had four pros. Mm. Had he, a fellow who got very famous afterwards, who, who really booked and started Brady Yard. I had a called Paddy McCaffrey from Ballabar Bay. He started a dance band after he left me. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one able to discover and give Brady Gallagher a job. Brady Gallagher, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he was with me then. So, one night they all came to me in the dressing and said, Look, George, this one is starting to bully us all. We don't like him. Would you ever take over the show and run it yourself and we work for you? I said, I was going to start amusement. I'm going to go into variety and drama. Yeah. Mark and I know nothing about that, but we'll work hard with you. So I said, Right. So I went down to a cave. I said to Keith, now we finish our contract on, our verbal contract finished on Sunday night. And I said, I want to be honest with you. I'm taking your company. Oh, geez, I went mad. Said, I'm taking the company because they want to come with me. They don't want to work with you and they'd say, you're bullying them, you're messed up. Now you go your way and I'll take your company. So I took his company. And I went in and my father at that time was in Leeslip. And my stepmother, she played the piano, lucky enough. And he was a bit of a And I booked them too. So I had six people in my own. And I weared a, a fellow up in... in 
Peterborough and the Excel Cinema, could I have a week in the cinema? And he wired back, yes, come send on the bills. I sent a few bills on and I went. And I brought that company up there and we opened there. And the business went away from that. I ran it there for 35 years. And that's how I got into John and Friday. Right. Mm -hmm. well, otherwise so I would have gone into a dodging track. That was a good I don't wonder did I do right or wrong, you know, which was the right way, which was the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have more fun and more But it was a success, you see, and I couldn't pack it yeah. up. Yeah. No. Couldn't pack it up, I had to keep going at it. Yeah. It got more and more of a success, you know, as time went on, it got bigger and bigger, I got to take you it. You see, the name of variety is like, is like the, the variety in your life, you've got to, yeah. you, like, like you know, you tried the variety, yeah. the variety of life, though, you right, see. Right, yeah. And it just... Yeah. And the only time I ever... Although it backfired, it still worked for you, And the know? only time I ever went back to amusements again was... In, in, in the house in Belfast, I was sitting in the house in Belfast, yeah. and I had never, I'd been finished with variety retire, sitting in the house, running a guest house, and this fellow knocked the door. And he was a big noise, Jack Swinson in Belfast, he's a director of umpteen companies, yeah. and he's a director of Trust Houses Party, you know, they're there. Yeah, yeah. So he came and knocked the door, he said, I'm looking for George Daniels, I went out, he said, Mr. Daniels, I believe you're in the pump fire business. Oh, I was. Well, he said, I know you've been a variety because you've been around here in the shows. But he said, I hear you've good experience, Pauline Barry was telling me you've good experience in, in uh, experience. Well, he says, we are going to run a big stint here in 1971, called Ulster 71, and Trust Houses Party is sending over 12 machines. We're looking for a good man. And they want to know, will you go to London? I'll pay your pair, give you a ticket. Will you go to London and have an, an interview with them? So I went to Piccadilly House, ticket and on, you did? like a gentleman, and I met Sir Leslie Joseph, the head man next to uh, Jack Party. To party. He yeah. was Sir yeah. Leslie Joseph was the next man. And I had a big interview up in the room, they asked me questions. What I had done, circus, oh you're the man well, well, you're the you're in charge of the amusements. Poor oh, man manager of the lot. Sent me back, give me a check, give me a big meal, a drink and a cigar, sent me back to Belfast. The stuff came over in containers. And my job was to be on the ground as it came, I had a plan. Down at Andale. It was a big thing, the government put up uh, some of £500,000 this year. Mm. And we ran from Easter to September. So anyway, that's how I got the job in the amusements again. I was back running that. So, Buddy Bird, the birds came up. They flew up yeah. the to see it. It was so big. In they had nothing like it then. In Belfast. Yeah. They had nothing like it then. All they had was either a cut show in the south. Yeah. And I had these big amusements all around me. I had a big wheel, and a track, and a speedway, and a poor lane glade. I had a set of jets, a set of old fashioned cars, umpteen stalls. Margot was working at. They gave Margot, they sent over a stall for Margot, who blessed her and gave it to her for nothing, wouldn't take a penny off her for the whole season. And she worked it herself as a, as a donation for yeah, what I did. Sure. Yeah. I have a recommendation, I'm not going to show it to you, but it would take me into heaven. Yeah. They give me such a great recommendation anyway. Yeah. Offered Margot and I work in England, what is to go to England? They wanted me to run Dundono after that. Yeah. They offered me Dundono, trust us as funny, to go and live there. Yeah. and run the remuda right beside the hotel. I wouldn't know. But however, when the birds came up, they were looking at all this stuff and they were amazed at the size of the shop. That was great. I met them at the airport and drove them to the airport. Yeah. That's why I got again so friendly with them. The next season, the whole show was packed up. I sent the whole show back to England. You know, and when it finished, Norman wrote to me and asked me if I'd join them. Would I come down and work with them as one of the brothers? You love the same position as any of my brothers on the show. Oh, I had the money yet. So in 1973 I went down and joined the birds and Margaret and I did a season with the birds. I left and went back to Belfast and for some reason I went back to the birds again. I don't know why, I was to come yeah. in here. No, I was sick, that was it. I was telling you. Mm -hmm. I was to come in here because I came up and measured this big shed. Did you? I measured all this in 1973. Yeah, because you had experience in 71 so, of measuring well, up the Yeah, that's that yeah. 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 And I was to come in here with them. I was to come in here with them. And I got sick and went to hospital. And I was in the hospital then, like, you know, all that 70, all 70 was in the hospital. Yeah. You know, two operations and what have you. So, it's, it's so the result is this is the first year now I got back to work. Yeah, but oh. they've got the idea from watching you in yeah. in Belfast then. Eh? Oh, it was the biggest thing that ever came to heaven, the thing we had in this place. They, but the army wired me on. You must see the wiring I had into the, into the machines, you know. Yeah. The army did that. The British army came up and did the whole things. All I had to do was go in and knock off switches, knock on switches. We had a big dome, a restaurant, and we had a Mrs. So and so, she was the manageress. We had about six managers under me. I had the bar manager, the restaurant manager, the disco manager. Yeah. That we had a special manager. We, they brought these domes, the same as my bloody cinema down there. We had yeah. five of them up. One was, the, one was the restaurant, the other was the bar, the other one was the disco, and the other one was for the slot machines. They even put 
cab and down at the bloody shop and think, well, what a pound that trust is for you. Money was an object. If I wanted a job done, you know, a bit of painting done. Well, I used to, you know, I was used to get the workmen to do it, you know, go around say, no, no, send for painters, get painters in charge, give them a check, yeah. get the freak men in. I couldn't, it was a different branch of show business to me altogether. Mm. I had a beautiful office. And then they said, oh, yeah, well, well, you, well, you was make to amend because of financial yeah. reasons, Mon all of a sudden money's no object. I thought the job was a bit too much for me, so yeah. I told uh, Mr. Powder when he came over, said, look, I, this is too much, you have to give me another man. He said, well, we have a good boy in training at the moment, in, uh, he's in Rill, you know? And uh, we sent him over, along with the, the, the poor man. The poor man came over with him, and Brian Ritter, his name was. And he worked on the afternoon because he was good at figures. He was a godsend to me, and him and I got on terribly well. He was unbelievable. We got on like that together. Mm -hmm. You know, but I kept him in the bloody office. Mm -hmm. But I kept out in the ground watching the soap, you know. Mm -hmm. And I kept him in the office doing the office work. We checked in the men on time, because we had the yeah. machines. We had to stop That them just in. eased a burden for you. And in every yeah. machine I had in that place, there was things like a, t you know, like a, a the husband in the shops for the uh, cash. Right? Tell it, yeah. And I could tell him that he was on every machine. Yeah. As soon as I got about on 18, he had to register 18, I could look up 18, I could count yeah. And I had to milk them every hour. We had a special office then for the cash, it was brought over. I had to milk every machine every hour. Take every penny mm. What What was the reaction of all the showmen at that time in and around Belfast? Oh, I can desolation, Pauline Barry went mad. Marie Mar was working for Pauline Barry, then she left Pauline yeah. Barry to go down and do this yeah. thing, you know. Uh, Mrs. David, Barry, yeah. Yeah, David. Turnbull was ripping the round, no, they didn't like it, you know. Yeah, like it was a big show, and they trusted us when they just had the stuff. Mm. They left us stuff in Blackpool and they took brought stuff from all mm. different. All the good gear. Good gear. Mm. I had a great set of chips. Was Ben Macaulay on the go then? He was, but he never, he came in twice. But he got nothing in there, you know. You know his son was in a few times with me then. That's how I got to know Benny, really. Ah, yeah. That's when the first time Benny came in and met me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But that's how I got back into the fair again. Yeah. I was doing music hall then, old time music hall in Belfast and doing the clubs. So I was fit then, you know. Yeah. And I was around doing all the pubs, getting a spot myself, get myself 50 quid a night, you know. Yeah. And the pubs then, the only nice. well, How did you meet uh, Joseph Locke? What's, what's it? Well, he's married to uh, my nephew's. No, my nephew was married to Joseph Locke's niece. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, how I met him. What, you, what kind of guy is he? What oh, nice, I liked him. Yeah. I liked him. Good bomb bastard. But uh, yeah. oh, he's a clever man, he's a pro, you know. Yeah. <coughs> you know that gag he has now, he's big numbers, you know. He's got a great gag now, he's you there, boys like where this could go, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know those top notes he used to hit, you know. Yeah. But he keeps a bottle of beer on the stage now, when a top note comes, he's the audience singing, he just takes it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then take the top note from the white horse, and you know that high yeah. note, you know. Goodbye. Oh, they take it from him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He puts down the beer and carries yeah. on. We saw him when he made his comeback in, in Lee. One of his, the first places he came to was Lee. Well, that, that was late sixties, wasn't it? Though? But he was a he was a, a, a Derry man, you know that. Mm. He's from Derry. He was a policeman. Must be in yeah. seventy now. Good policeman, wasn't he? Isn't that what he was? And I'll tell you another thing. <clears throat> you know this fellow Johnny Logan. Yeah. His father was with me. Mm. I travelled his father as a tenor. Uh, Patrick O'Hagan. That was his father. And Patrick, mm. I can tell you a story about Patrick. I'm glad this is funny. Patrick Hague and Harry Bailey came to you one time, and Harry Bailey was a fairly good comic. Yeah. He lives at Mallow Hyde, he's my cousin, and they came back from England. And they were after making a big name, and just uh, uh, Patrick Hague was singing that song, the, the Irish Soldier. He had made a record of it, and it was doing big. And he says, they wanted a tour in Ireland. So Harry came and he says, look, if we get a show together, George, you put the rest, it'll be me. I'll have to do the comedy. I said, fair enough, Harry. There'll be Patrick Hague, the singer, he says, you'll run, you can run it, and you'll get a good few quid. I mean, you run us around the island, so he says, I'll be so I got the company together, my own company, you know, and I topped them, top of the bill, one night only. And I booked all these bloody cinemas. There we go, anyway, but as a comedian, Harry wasn't too successful in the country. He was really all right in England, but, you know, <laughs> different in the country, you know, a bit tougher. Oh, we got over that, but Hagen was singing. <clears throat> and Hagen didn't like the bloody tour in Ireland at all. After about a week of it, he was getting See. a bit fed up in the country halls, you know. But we went into Bally Bay, I'll never forget it. And we played the old cinema in Bally Bay, and under the, the sofa that owned the cinema in Bally Bay was a bit of a nutcase, you know. He kept hands. Yes. And he had all the bloody hands on the Stacey Mary, you know. <laughs> Hundreds of hands on the oh. cocks. Oh my <laughs> oh, God. Was, then he used to let them out in the field at the back because the cinema was built up high. Uh -huh. And he hangs on, singing his head off. And the next thing they had, one of the cocks started, Go, oh, you did! <laughs> and the bloody cock is. But I felt in just a bloody face, Harry Bailey nearly died. 
Oh, Patsy got a taxi after the show that night and went home. That's enough of that. No more of that. I was on singing in the next band. I had to go out and do the numbers. The cock's daddy crying when he... Oh, bloody hell, that'll be his number. The cock's in the audience. Oh, God. <laughs> he was such a good voice. The cock's were cool. Huh? He was a trippy singer. Ah, yeah. Beautiful voice he had. So how did the audience react to that? They nearly died. They must have died laughing. Because all the audience would know that the hens were... Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they knew the hens were down there. Yeah. I never thought about them. Harry didn't know Egg. None of us ever thought about mm. the bloody cocks from down there. Mm. Well, I'll talk about that. Egg was gone the next day. Oh. Well, none of that. Even the cocks were taking the mickey out of him. Oh no, you could Joe Lynch used to be a good singer as well, didn't you? Joe Lynch used to be a good singer. I knew Joe very well. I spent a lot of touch, spent a lot of my youth with Joe when yeah. he was young. Very clever boy. I remember Joe saying to me one time I said to him in London, I lent him. Uh, he wanted a few of my Irish numbers. He was playing the Metropolitan as he wrote. I don't know he's with Brady Gallagher or somebody, but uh, he wanted a couple of copies of some numbers I had. Old Bob Road or some of them, you know. Round around the gambler, you know, and I had the orchestrations. There were six or seven in the band. He used yeah. to always carry my orchestrations in. Yeah. And yes, I went to a theatre where there were seven or eight in the band, you'd give yeah. out your copies. <coughs> so I said, and Joe, why don't you get stuck into variety, a terrific variety of performer? <coughs> he said, No way, George, I'd rather be an actor. And he was right, he, he became an actor. He did, yeah. Uh, and he, he, he refused some but very he's good in the readings and that, isn't he? Yeah, he refused, and that was mm. like Glenn Rowe. Then no, that's the only thing. A very good actor, John. A very yeah. nice fella. Yeah. I got on to my sin. What a singer, though. Cracking singer. Yeah. Oh, I got, so oh, he used to record on the Sun label. A oh, yellow oh. label, 78 records. He right? was singing them cock numbers like nobody's business. Ah, Brilliant voice. Got him singing uh, Great. Soldier Boy. Good, good, good Minnick and everything. Yet yeah. he wouldn't sing. He didn't like it. He loved the actor. He wanted to be an actor. And you see, mm. the bug was there to be an actor. What can you do? Mm. Did you hear the story about the... Englishman that came to Ireland for the first time, a young Englishman, you see, and he heard about how tough the Irish were over there. You know? Oh, yeah. So he's hitchhiking. So hitchhiking, he chanted, you know. He was a bit nervous. But he's hitchhiking along a bog road one day, and this old farmer came up with a nasty carriage, you know, a donkey carriage. Yeah. First time he ever seen one, so he up with a thumb. The farmer, ooh, the dog, got him up beside him, you know, on the board. He's sitting there, anybody beside the farmer. The farmer popping the pipe, and he looked down and there's a pig in the back of the carriage, you know. He says, what do you do with the pigs, sir? Well, he says, I says, sometimes he says, I kill them and we cook them and keep them over there, you know, smoke them and do them. But this one, he says, I'm going to sell. I'm going to the fair now to sell it. I need a few quid. Oh, that's fair enough. So he looked down, there was a shotgun, single barrel shotgun at his feet. He says, what about the gun, sir? <laughs> and I says, well, he says, when I'm coming home, he says, I might raise a cock pheasant or I could raise a rabbit. He says, I have a crack at it. He says, take it home to the wife. She's delighted. Said, fair enough. So they're going around it. Negotiating a very bad band, and one of these Dutch men came around in one of these big Mercedes, you know, these Dutch showmen, you know, mm -hmm. flying he was, a bit over on his wrong side. So he hit the ass and cart on the wheel, and he tumbled the cart upside down, and the farmer fell out, the English fellow fell out, the pig and all, and the English fellow was badly injured. He broke his rib and his leg, and he's in terrible pain, lying in the ditch. Oh, Jesus, he's in terrible pain. And the farmer got out, and he was okay, and he looks down, and the pig is badly injured. So the farmer gets the pig, and the imp was lying there in pain watching him. <laughs> he gets the gun, he shoots the pig, bang. He opens up the gun, he puts another cartridge into it, and he comes over to the young English, and he says, come here, he says, are you all right? The young English, I never felt better than my life, sir. It only hurts me when I laugh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Oh, there's been some, good, some good jokes out. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so you like it in Belfast, do you, George? <coughs> I think it was the best thing I've ever made. Mm -hmm. And do you know, I never told you that. Do you know Mark and I were doing before we went to Belfast? We had a fishing ship shop in the old. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know. <coughs> we had the summer fishing ship shop. I was making the ships and cooking the fish and she was serving it outside. So, <laughs> we did two seasons of that for Jumbo. Mm. It was an experiment. Jumbo built a shop 